backbone leading. Um, you also have to look after yourself. So you're only as good as your own brain and your own physical and mental well-being. So my gift to you is three little secrets that I'm going to share. One is a tremendously important one and one that I live by. So when I was writing my own book, it was in the aftermath of my husband Richard passing away. And I wouldn't have said that I was necessarily living in the slow lane of life. I owned 11 businesses at the time. Um, I was leading a huge team of people. But I certainly felt very strongly that I probably wasn't done with my life's ambitions. And that is a message I'd give to all of you that if you do nothing today, spend a little bit of time saying to yourself, <clears throat> am I done yet? Because that's the, the three words uh, that went over and over in my mind um, after he passed. Am I done yet? Everything that I learned when I was growing up, um, mother nature, my parents, my education, my upbringing, all of the aspirations I had and my dreams for my future life. Um, was I finished? Did I really want to hit the age of 60 and sit down and wonder if I had achieved everything I had to achieve? I guess I was spurred on by the fact that um, Richard was taken quite young and there are lots of Richards in this world who never get to fulfill their ambitions. There are lots of uh, young girls who are growing up now in places like Sierra Leone who don't have a life expectancy that we do. So we owe it to all of them maybe to fulfill everything that we can achieve in our lives. So in my search for um, some inspiration, I came across a wonderful man called Thomas Studdendorf. I can send out the link later. He's an anthropologist and he's based in Australia. Uh, he's since discovered that I'm a big fan of his, so he messages me quite regularly. But he's one of the foremost anthropologists in the world. And he set out on a quest to find out what makes us uniquely human. So this is a very important message, I think, for all of us, because if you think about the planet and all of the other species of animals, what sets us apart? What sets us apart to the point where we're virtually eradicating thousands of species and we rule the planet? <clears throat> Thomas Studdendorf, um, unlike Darwin, believed that we came from a slightly different branch. So if you go back, I promise you this is going to go somewhere. If you go back to our nearest relatives, the chimpanzees, the monkeys, the apes, the gorillas, he believes there was a separate branch that developed us into human beings. And by the way, all of the foremost anthropologists of our time feel the same way now. And he discovered just two distinct differences between us and the animal kingdom. I spend a lot of time in Africa, so I spend a lot of time observing animals and you can tell that a matriarch of an elephant tribe is talking to the other elephants and saying come this way she's communicating with them dolphins certainly communicate with other dolphins to let them know there's lots of sardines to be eaten um, it's true that animals can have monogamous relationships they can show love and affection they can care for their young but there are really only two traits which human beings have that nobody else has um, in the animal kingdom the first one will come as no surprise for you. Human beings uniquely like to swap stories and share experiences. <clears throat> Perhaps today we're doing that. Um, it's the reason why we can sit down next to somebody on a bus or a train or in a restaurant or a cafe and just chat to them, just for the sake of chatting to them. Not to say we're going in this direction or there's some great food to eat. We just like to communicate. Needless to say, the best brains of my generation and yours have not been spent curing cancer. They've been spent finding more unique and novel ways for us as humans to swap stories and share experiences. By the way, Thomas Studdendorf wrote a tremendous book about three years ago called The Gap, What Separates Us from the Animals, where all of these thoughts are explored. And he's a regular uh, contributor to New Scientist and National Geographic. But it's the second difference that's the really cool thing and the really big message for you as my fellow human beings and women. We have this tremendous superpower inside us, one that we sometimes fail to exercise, especially as we get older. That is the power to mentally time travel. Uniquely as humans, you can ping your brain back to your earliest memory. Not the one implanted by your sister or your brother or your mother or father. Your own earliest memory. Your brain has the ability to remember that moment. And like a videotape, it collects all of your memories throughout your life to use in the present day. 
even better. Human beings have the ability to appreciate time way beyond their own lifespan. Back to Stephen Hawking's Big Bang Theory. We can appreciate events in history and how they affect us today. Closer to home, we can appreciate our own DNA, our families and our backgrounds and where they came from. That's not really the cool thing, by the way. Just so you know that when you go through life, whenever a memory is attached to an emotion, it's stored in a drawer much higher up in your brain, which is why you always remember things that were highly emotionally charged, sometimes the first day at school, sometimes when a grandparent passes away or the birth of a sibling. But the really cool thing, the really inventive thing that humans can do is we can ping our brains into the future and we can imagine scenarios in the future and using free will, we can determine how to get there. It's like setting a sat nav for your brain. Let me tell you why that's important, especially in the context of me saying, are you done yet? So my boy, he turned 20 years old yesterday. Him and his friends sat at the counter in my kitchen and they constantly talked about what they were gonna do when they were growing up. Their brains were on fire. They were sparking off each other. They were debating, discussing, arguing. They were at the very best that humans can be in terms of their brain power. And as we get older, certainly in our 20s, we begin to appreciate the power of looking to the future. It may be looking to the future of a career or marrying somebody or getting that car or going for that PhD or going for the masters. But during our twenties, we're pretty good at looking to the future. As we drift into our thirties and forties, we stop looking to the future. Not deliberately at first. Sometimes life just takes over. It becomes very busy. The average age when somebody settles down after studying, after a life, they call it in the 20s, the decade of indulgence. I don't know what the decade is in India. In Ireland, it's the age between 23 and 33. The end of full-time study and the start of commitment. 33, a commitment to maybe a husband, a family, a career, certainly a mortgage, pensions. But during that decade of indulgence, life is all about you. During our 20s, it's meant to be spend on me, I just look after me. I have no other commitments, no responsibilities, no accountabilities. So when we get into our 30s, that's when the problems begin to start because life becomes very busy. We might have a husband, a partner, family, career, juggling work-life balance. We get up by rote. We just wake up every morning, get through the day, go to bed, get up the next day. We've all been there, getting through the next day. And we stop looking forward. Life is just too busy. We're just getting through time. And then we hit our 40s and wonder, whoa, how did that happen? How did I get to 40? And then we start to drift towards 50. And still we're not looking forward. Partly because nobody looks to their grandparents and their parents and says, yeah, I want to be old and frail like the next generation. I think that's a really big mistake for us because your brain hates that. Your brain doesn't want you to start um, stalling in life. And worse, when we get into our 40s, we sometimes begin to look backwards. We go back to music we used to listen to. We continue to wear clothes we used to wear. Maybe our hair gets in the same style all the time. We sometimes like to go back to the same places, maybe the same restaurants, the same place for holidays. Our circle of friends becomes smaller. In fact, we avoid people who might debate or discuss things with us. We go out of our way to have a smaller circle of friends. Our conversation style is more simple. We're no longer debating or arguing or discussing. We're not anxious and sparking for life. So the reason your brain hates that is if you're going backwards or you're standing still, you're not moving forwards. Our life expectancy in Ireland is 82. There is a lot of life still to live. If you get to 60, you get four more bonus years. So the, the sad reality is that if you stop looking forward, you will inevitably start to, to decline because the vulnerable old age is around mid 70s. And you have to start working very hard from your 40s onwards to make sure that your brain is alive and it's sparking and it's looking to the future. So my first message to all of you is, regardless as to what age you are, set that sat nav in your future. Because your brain is not that clever, by the way. And if you tell it that you're going to do something, maybe you're in your 40s and you never did that PhD, 
never you he never played in the, the band or you know learned how to play the guitar or climbed the mountain or traveled to that wonderful island you always went to go to this is the time when you set that sat nav you're coming towards the end of the year you give yourself permission to wipe the slate clean of anything you didn't do this year that you could do next year set the sat nav and your brain will start working towards that determination that's my number one gift to you. <clears throat> my second is much more to do with you yourself and your ability to think innovatively. So if you're mentoring other people, obviously it takes a lot of your brain power and your energy to ensure that other people fulfill their potential. And as we grow older, obviously we don't have our parents patting us on the head anymore. We have very few other people telling us how brilliant we are, how wonderful we are. If we're working on our own, it tends to be quite lonely. So you need to find ways of thinking differently yourself. So back to a little bit of history again. In the, in the past, um, sorry, I have a bit of noise interference there. <coughs> so in the past, uh, hello? Can somebody mute their sound there? Uh, hello? Hello? Are we back? Great. So, um, so the second one is about your brain and how it thinks creatively. Way back in the day, everything was available to be invented. That's the best way of putting it. So our brains had a little muscle that we used continuously, constantly used this. So remember that nowadays, everything already exists. You walk into a room, you can flick a switch and a light comes on. I'm sitting on a chair, I'm looking into a phone, I have a computer behind me, I have books on the wall. There's very little left to invent and our brains become lazy. And that little muscle, the power of invention that's embedded in our brain, just remains stagnant for most of our lives. The funny thing about this muscle in our brains is you can use it up until the age of 18 really easily. Children find it immensely easy to use this particular muscle. Around about the age of 21 to 23, it starts getting more difficult. And as you get older as an adult, it's incredibly hard to think this way. So I studied strategy all my life. I went to Ashridge Management College and studied strategy for two years. I was so good at looking to the future, I went back and did advanced strategic management. And then I read an incredible book that kind of blew my brain away. It's on our thinking that I had never thought of before. It revolutionized how I approach strategy. So if you're interested in keeping your brain as innovative as possible, then my advice is get hold of this book. I have it everywhere. Actually, it's right here on the shelf next to me with, of course, sticky colored notes sticking out of every page. But I also have it next to my bed. I have it next to me in the car. A new edition has just come out. Um, so it's called Blue Ocean Thinking. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. Uh, it's a different way of thinking in your brain. It's one of those things that maybe when I describe it, and I will simply, it does sound simple, but actually it's incredibly hard. It's a thought process that sometimes I think I get, I can read through paragraphs and it stays inside and then I'll read another paragraph and it starts to slither away. But it's really, really worth focusing on this. And if you have children, as I say, under the age of 23, ideally between 12 and 18, then make them do one of these thought processes every week. My boy has been doing it since he was 10, a blue ocean thought. So let me explain what it is so that you understand how to think this way. So, Let's imagine that the blue oceans are those beautiful, clear, verdant, blue, wonderful waters that no one else swims in. Uncontested space in terms of business. So there's nobody else there. You're on your own swimming in these beautiful waters, blue oceans. Red oceans, on the other hand, are a bloodbath. That's where everybody is. That's where we're all competing on price, on quality, on speed. Sometimes I'm asked to go into small towns um, all over Europe, which have been decimated by the recession, to try and help them repopulate their retail space. And what typically I find is that maybe there are two coffee shops, two florists, two garages, and they're not innovative in their thought. They're just competing with each other as to how early they open or how cheap they can sell the petrol or how fast they can bring the best flowers. Red oceans. Nobody wants to be in red oceans. If you see the train leaving the station, it means it's too late. 
So the key thing is, how do we get ideas that are going to be in blue oceans? How do we find those new spaces, those things that have never been invented before? For one thing, our brain is our best ally. So this part of your brain that you have to start to stretch has to rely on the fact that nothing has existed before. You cannot just tailor something that's already been invented. Sometimes when I ask my son to give me a blue ocean thought, he'll tell me about a school bag that has reflector lights for the dark when he's cycling. Not a blue ocean thought, because it's just another version of a school bag. So here's two examples that are from the book. And if you go online and look up blue ocean thinking, you might find up to a thousand examples. There are lots of them. But these two, I think, are, are very easy to understand. I lecture blue ocean thinking with hotel groups all over the world. And sometimes I literally put the staff into a room with nothing in it, no bed, no dressing table, nothing. And I say, a stranger is coming to the door. What are you going to put into the room to force them to think this way? Nintendo, you know this name, Nintendo. Nintendo taught all of their staff blue ocean thinking. So after a while, they began to think and imagine things that no one in the gaming world had thought of before. So at that time, gaming was personified by boys like my son. They were single teenage boys, usually on their own, in their bedrooms, playing a game. It's quite a lonely activity, a little bit geeky. And the entire world of gaming was targeting that particular consumer group, teenage boys, sometimes older teenage boys. Then Nintendo, through Blue Ocean Thinking, came up with two distinctive products that revolutionized the world of gaming. And they swam in blue ocean waters for a period of time. The first was a game which saw an entire family, from a young toddler all the way up to a grandparent, playing a game around a television set. It was called Nintendo Wii. And the second was a game entirely targeted at women, Nintendo DS. So for a brief period of time, Nintendo, through Blue Ocean Thinking, and teaching their staff Blue Ocean Thinking, recreated the world of gaming. Now, it's a red ocean now, but they did it. The second one, you may know this particular example. It's a little bit more accessible. When I grew up, the circus. The circus was beset with allegations of animal cruelty. It was a low ticket price. It was entirely targeted at children. Worse, you had to put the circus on the back of a lorry and carry it from town to town. Then a group of people, through blue ocean thinking, reimagined the whole way that circuses were considered. They came up with a circus that was a fixed venue, a high ticket price, entirely targeted at adults. It had no animals, and it was, of course, Cirque du Soleil, through blue ocean thinking. So my advice to you, you set your sat nav for your brain through my anthropologist friend, Thomas Studdenborough. Now you need to get your brain to move in an innovative way. And the best way to do it is to practice blue ocean thinking. And if you have a business or you're struggling to find a new idea, don't pay for expensive management consultants. Get your 18 year old in, even better your 12 year old, because whether it's growing up with imaginative films like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, they can reimagine space in a way that us adults can't. Now my third message to you <laughs> is to do with the difference between women and men and not the obvious one. So a little while ago, I set out to discover why it was that women behave differently to men in the corporate environment and also in terms of founding their own business. So one thing for sure is that all the behavioral studies that are now well tested are absolutely true. So the behavioral studies um, show that women are less likely to ask for a raise, less likely to put themselves forward for a job unless they feel that they're 100% ready. They're less likely to speak up in meetings, especially if they're alone, more likely to speak if there's two, more likely to speak if there's three, best chances if there's 30%, more likely to apologize for things that they're not necessarily guilty of. So all of these behaviors Behaviors I had seen myself in life. I worked in the corporate world for many, many years, ran businesses for big global giants before I founded my own business. And then as a female founder and a mentor of female founders, I was seeing the same things over and over again with women. 
who probably didn't get that magic one million within the three years as often as the men did. <clears throat> a third less likely to get to that magic one million turnover. So why is that? Well, in my lifetime, I have consistently relied on science. Everything that I've done from my 20s upwards has been evidence-based. Um, right from my MPhil to my PhD, if ever I'm struggling, both of my TED Talks are founded on science, even though they're dealing with topics like grief. Um, so I delved into the science. I brought a team of researchers together with me and said, let's look at the science, the evidence-based science, the pure robust science that we can find on what it really is the difference between women and men in terms of their working lives. So after a while, we discovered, A, that this is a very new science. It's not been studied for very long, and quite often it's contradictory. It's contradictory sometimes because the sample size is quite small, or it's subjective, or it's not robust enough. So we discarded all of those studies. And we came down to a very small pile of literature relating to women and men, and only four differences, which I'm now going to tell you. These four differences are not necessarily the four differences you might imagine. So people always criticize women for not being able to park cars. And this is nothing to do with men are from Mars and women are from Venus. This is very much to do with the differences that might impact on how a woman behaves in her working life, in her profession, um, and certainly as a, a female founder or a woman who aspires to get to the top in business. Two of them are in the brain. The first thing I'd say is if I lined up all of the brains of men and women right here, right now, you wouldn't be able to tell much difference between them. We're more alike than we are unalike, save for two areas. So the first area is called the interior singulate. Um, sometimes this is known as the uh, worry wart center. And in women, way back in the hunter gatherer period, men went out and fought the lions and the women went up on the high ground and they scanned for danger. So women uniquely have a more developed sense of danger in the distance. So like a radar for things that might go wrong. Why is this important? Because women uniquely make lists of pros and cons. So when I cited those behavioral studies about women not going forward for jobs until they felt they were 120% ready, that's because in their minds, they're working out what could go wrong. There's a small voice inside their brains continually telling them that maybe they would fail, that they wouldn't get the job, that their colleagues might laugh at them, that if they took the job, they might be very bad at it, that maybe their family might suffer, maybe they wouldn't get a chance to pick up their children from school. So they imagine all sorts of scenarios in the future that could possibly go wrong if they choose a particular direction. In their personal lives, and I know this to my cost, that I would do that too. Certainly when it comes to choosing a family event or going on holidays, I always look at the upside and the downside. So in business, this can be negative. I have been the person around the table when the chairman has cited a great vision and um, has determined a path for the future. And um, I'm the one who's saying, well, let's look whether that's the right direction. And he's not happy with me. He's saying, you're wrecking my buzz. I really want to go in this direction. This is the vision I've set. Let's all come on board. The reason why this particular skill is tremendously important in business is that women tend to be risk averse. And um, this is one of the most important things you can do in business is when you're looking to something in the future, that you look at all possible avenues, that you look at all of the things that could possibly go wrong. Needless to say, in very much in the developed world, women tend to get to the CEO position through finance. Your finance person tends to be the person who pours cold water on any good idea you have about the future. It's almost a requirement. There was a time some time ago when almost every top legal position in Ireland was held by women because in the legal profession, this is a tremendously important skill. Now, the second difference is also in the brain. It's in the rumination center or the amygdala. The rumination center is, um, is, it lights up more readily. In fact, worth listening to this. So in scientific terms, um, it lights up more readily in women to negative stimuli. In other words, if somebody says something bad to us, we tend to think about it more and dwell on it longer. So women uniquely ruminate on things for a long period of time. I'm mentoring a man who is mentoring a woman at the moment, and he's very frustrated because she's still talking about something that happened in the boardroom six months ago, and she can't let it go, and he can't understand why she can't let it go. 
But women too, do tend to dwell on things that happened in the past. Now, fine, this could be a negative in terms of, um, I also was that person sitting at meetings where we would have failed at a plant in Norway. Everyone wanted to move on. I wanted to rake over the codes. I wanted to know what went wrong, why it went wrong. And really none of the men around the table wanted to do the same thing. The reason why it's so important is in business terms, I grew up when we didn't talk about failure. Now we say that failure is the most important thing. It's nature's harshest, but best teacher. But in my experience, sometimes men don't want to learn from failure. It's done, it's dusted. They want to wipe their hands clean and move on. Women like to learn from failure. It's a tremendously important asset in business that we look back and we find out what went wrong, what could we have done differently? Was it the product? Was it the market? Was the price point? Did we not do proof of concept right? So learning from failure is one of the most important uh, things that women can do. When Christian Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund, said we should have had more Lehman sisters than Lehman brothers, that's what she meant. Women are fantastic at being risk averse. Can somebody but mute on their phone, please? Thank you. Can somebody but mute on their phone, please? Thank you. So the last two um, differences uh, between women and men are very obvious. One is we're fueled by different hormones. Men are fueled by testosterone, we're fueled by estrogen. It's an obvious scientific fact. We have 10% um, of the testosterone that a man has. Now, estrogen is a fantastic hormone. It's a bonding hormone. It avoids conflict. It's fantastic at making our children play together. And um, it's a fantastic team working hormone. Men, with testosterone tends to be um, competitive, winning, acting as a singular individual. Um, they also tend to be quite ambitious and driven and focused. Um, they're not uncomfortable with conflict. The reason why this is really important is that most of our corporate environments are built around that competitive environment rather than the team working environment. If I give a woman an award, the first thing she will do is say, this is not an award for me. It's an award for my entire team. And women are hugely uncomfortable bringing themselves forward for commissions and bonuses um, because of this particular need to feel that they're part of a team, which is the future of the corporate world, the future of business. All of our reward structures in terms of promotion and bonuses and pay are built around um, the male model, which is competitive and ambitious and beating the person and their colleague next to them um, to try and... and in, there's plenty of studies in this. There's one that was done last year in the London Stock Exchange which tested the testosterone of men in their saliva while they were making risky trades. And when they made risky trades, their testosterone went up and they charted the course of one young man for 22 days until he virtually burned out because every risky trade gave him a testosterone boost and every time he got a bonus, his testosterone rose by at least 10%. So I think... Oestrogen and testosterone are a very important difference between women and men, but not a negative, definitely not a negative. If you look to the future and you see how joint CEO positions are beginning to develop, I do think that big corporates are beginning to understand that actually those unique skills are tremendously important in business. The last one, are, the last difference is called um, the elementary studies, really personified by a wonderful psychologist called Carol Dweck. So if we raise both of our children the same and we put them to school at the age of four, um, unfortunately, their experiences tend to be different. So girls have finer motor neuron skills. They tend to learn to be quiet and to sit and be neat and tidy in the classroom. The boys run like wild animals down the corridor. They tend to get rewarded for knocking lumps out of each other, beating each other in competitive sports. Girls learn um, from an early age that being neat and tidy and on time and doing their homework is the way to get rewards. And it stands to them sometimes in life. Girls do far better than boys at school. They outperform boys at almost every metric, at every exam, both at first, second and third level education. It's only when they go into the workplace that those differences begin to appear. And that's largely because, as Carl Dweck said, if life was one long school, women would be the undisputed leaders of the world. I'm going to pause there. I've given you three thought processes. One is to do with yourself and setting your sat nav and how important that is to you as a human being. Are you done yet? The second is finding a more innovative way of thinking, using your brain to its full potential. 
And the third is so you will understand the differences between women and men so that you can see that they're not negatives. They're actually tremendously positive. So I'll just stop there for questions if that's okay. Thank you, Nora. That was that was really, really nice. So uh, I would want uh, the women on the on the group, uh, some men as well. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we will unmute you or you could, you know, put put the questions on the chat box. In the app, if you're in the app or if you're on the phone, you can you can see that. <clears throat> okay, Paroma, go ahead. Paroma, do you have a question? Okay, Paroma says, great session. Thanks so much, Nora. The question is, the feeling that men dominate the work world is that just a perception or are there metrics are, or are the metrics skewed towards it? So um, I know all of the metrics from Europe and America. So in Ireland, we have um, just 16% of women on boards um, of the publicly listed companies. So that's a really a tiny amount. Not only does it mean that, that on most of those companies, there are no women. Um, on the others, there's one and very very few women can affect change when it's one. The magic number is 33%, a third, when you start to affect change. What's, what's more important is that, although it's slightly higher in the UK, uh, they brought in some uh, quotas, not mandatory, voluntary codes, where they insisted that they bring women onto boards. They started at 16% and they ended at 26% last year, and they now have a new quota. Um, the U.S. is roughly in the same zone as Ireland, at around 16 to 18 percent. And across Europe, the only countries that have increased the number of women on their boards and in the pipeline for their C-suite level, more importantly, is in the countries that have taken um, mandatory quotas. So, in other words, the Norwegian, Norway, Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, um, even France and Germany have joined mandatory quotas. So we may not like the idea of making companies um, employ women to get up to that magic one third, but it does actually achieve results. It's probably the only thing that's achieving results. I think more importantly than putting women on boards, um, we have to help young women um, you know, find the career ladder and go up through the pipeline. Parachuting women onto boards is one thing, but it doesn't affect change in the organization. We actually need to see more and more women filtering in. You know, when, when that scenario that I described to you of the woman and the man, you know, leaving school, let's just say, even for argument's sake, they leave with the same qualifications and they join a bank at the age of 23. Exact same qualifications, exact same ambitions, both of them believe they're going to do phenomenally well in life. The reality is that John is 10 times more likely to get to the corner office in the sky and Mary is twice as likely to have left. So we need to find out why, which is why all my studies in Planet Woman are about what holds those women back. You know, what's the cultural disconnect for them in organisations? So I, to your point, I've never met a man who doesn't want a woman to exceed in business. The reality is that it's, it's grown up. Our corporate world has grown up around the ideologies around men. Don't forget that um, the first generation of women to make it into the boardroom are still alive. So we're still in a very youthful phase. Um, I'm probably the third generation of women to make it into the boardroom. So it's still very, very new. In my lifetime, women were just secretaries. They took dictation. Um, you know, I take my hat off to those first women who, without any equal opportunity legislation, managed to elbow their way into the boardroom and get it to the top. But often they did so by adopting male attributes. And now we need to enter a new phase where women can be women. In all of the guises that women are, we can be authentic to our true self. We don't have to pretend to be other people. And we need to 
work in ways where our unique skills are valued as much as um, the skills of men. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nora. Very, very nice. So I, I totally agree where you said women need to be women and not to emulate uh, male, uh, uh, you know, male uh, characteristics. But and you also said that in your in your uh, study that you know women worry more, they ruminate more, they are fueled by different hormones and uh, their expression is different. So how do women? I mean, how do we as women, you know, sort of having these traits and these are very unique to us. Uh, how do we still, you know, sort of, I mean, why is it that we are being trained? Why are the men being trained? How, how, how do we, you know, sort of manage that? Because everybody comes and tells us that we want, that you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. Uh, the world has to change. The entire ecosystem has to change. So how do we, how do we, how do we change this? Good question. Um, I think, you know, going back to the, the first group of women who entered the Fortune 1000 companies in the US, fascinating. They did some research on them and said, how did you get to the boardroom? So, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cough. Um, no surprise. 99% of them said, by putting my hand up fastest, by answering the question quickest, mm -hmm. by offering to do cross project support. So by being the brightest and the best, that is always 100% why women and men get to the top. What will surprise you is the second highest reason why those women said they got into the boardrooms was learning how to get on with men. Now, I would love to tell you that the second highest reason for men would be learning how to get on with women, but that's not the reality that we live with at the moment. So what I, what I say is I go into a bank or a big corporation and I advise them all the time on how they can get gender diversity and gender parity, better balance in their businesses. And I say, you're already flying on one wing brilliantly. You have amazing male leaders. Wouldn't you like to have amazing female leaders too? Without question, every one of them says, yes, how do we do this? So I set about on a journey with them to say culturally, you have to change the organization. When they did gender pay more monitoring in the UK this year, I don't know if you monitored it, but in, in January, the early part of the year, the UK monitored businesses over a certain size and how much they paid women versus men. This is not equal pay for equal work. That's against the law to pay that differently. This is the average salary for women versus the average salary for men. We're currently monitoring that in Ireland at the moment at a government level. So are many countries in Europe. The results really shocked people especially when it came to big banks like Barclays and others, where the women working there had seen their companies as being champions of gender diversity. These are companies that went out of their way to showcase how their human resources departments were, you know, looking to women, helping to develop women. And yet the parity between gender pay was somewhere in the region of 30 to 40%. It was huge. So they got ripped apart in all the newspapers and all of a sudden they were going, oh, hang on, we know why that is. We know now why there's a 30 to 40% difference in women and men's average salary because we have more men in senior position, like it was a fait accompli, like as though there was never going to be any other reason. Well, you know, hi, did you ever think of the fact that women could be in those positions? But even more importantly, to my point, when it came to commission and bonuses, the gender pay parity was in the region of 60 to 70%. So the entire way that they rewarded women and men was the same, regardless of the fact that men were doing far better under that scheme than women. Men are far more driven by commission and bonuses. So my point is, I cannot change the whole of an organization. I can't go into the bank and say, I'll come in here and change your culture. I'll change your reward system. What I try to do at Planet Woman is say, there are many things that are going to hold a woman back in her life, but it shouldn't be her. If you have an understanding of some of the things that might hold you back as a person, then maybe you can overcome them. For instance, going for that job. I mean, the wonderful thing about a brain is that there's something called plasticity. So when you do it once, it becomes easier. I know it feels scary to go over the cliff and to quieten all those voices that goes on in our heads to tell us why we shouldn't do things. But the reality is that when you're terrified to speak publicly and you pluck up the courage to do it the first time, the second time is easier, the third time is easier, the fourth time is easier. When I sit with women for Planet Woman for our academies, what I always try and do is find a woman who's done it. So for every one woman 
who sits on the sofa with me. There are another nine who don't get that. The key for me is to find out how did that one woman do it? What is her story? What are the pivotal moments? And there are always those moments when she quietened those voices. There's always a reason why she took that risk. So the more we unwork those real life stories that women have, the better it is for younger women coming after them to learn how to do it. When I talked about the sat nav, the reality is if you want to get somebody you've never been before, if you set your store by being the CEO or the finance director or the HR director and you need to get there, what's the best way to get there? Ask somebody who's there already, which is why it's so important that we keep talking to women who manage to get to the top to find out how they do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. And thank you for so much, you know, great insights. So there's a question from Purva. Uh, where she says confidence levels don't stay consistent for women particularly something that happens in the personal lives has an impact on the confidence levels at workplace what's your take on this and how do we rebuild confidence so it's always confidence not competence that holds women back whenever i talk to women even if they're ones you know trying to raise funds to start their own business the first person who says no to them they just buckle under and they, you know, men will dust themselves down and go back into the next bank or go to the next financier. So confidence is a huge issue for women. Uh, going back just to that, the question I just answered about plasticity. Confidence is, you know, lack of confidence isn't a lifelong condition. I was not a child who put my hand up in the classroom. I was not a confident child ever. I think you might have found me as a tree in the school play. Um, it grew during my 20s and it grew out of adversity, to be perfectly honest. If you know my life story and you've watched my TED talk, then it's not a topic I want to discuss today. But definitely I learned risk and determination um, and resilience probably in my 20s. And maybe confidence came a little bit later. But I think that if you, I'll, I'll talk about the stages of life in a minute, but, but if you imagine, you know, the scenario where I'm talking about speaking up in the meeting. As mentors, I, I work very closely with chairman and CEOs and to talk to them about if they have one woman sitting around the table, allow her to speak, change the rules of the meeting. Don't allow it to be a free for all. So pause and consciously ask her if she'd like to make a contribution. So through working with people who are in lead leadership positions, we can have women to speak up and believe it or not, once a woman has spoken up once or twice in a meeting where the rules are more formal, she feels more comfortable speaking up again and again. In our personal lives, we need to find ways in which we can accept that we are hardwired to ruminate. I just told you why. Um, unfortunately, that's a scientific fact. So we're hardwired to ruminate and we do have that worry ward tendency. But we can suppress it. It's not a bad thing. I think it, we allow it to overwhelm us when we look to the future and say, what could go wrong? We see that as a negative because society and our businesses and organizations tell us it's negative. But it's just one of the most useful skills ever. We should always look at what could possibly go wrong in the future and, and then accept that, that is, that's the risk. You know, If you can accept that risk, then you jump over that cliff, dive into that ocean. Um, I would just say that in my lifetime, like everybody else, I've gone through, you know, my own share of adversity through grief and bereavement, my husband, my sister, my father, through my own personal life experiences. And um, if this webinar was on failure, I'd be here for four hours. And I'd only have probably talked about the first 10 failures. Um, but these things teach us in life. And you know that a favorite phrase that um you know sometimes you can't get beaten by things that go wrong that is true to a certain point you know it's true that when things go wrong and we dust ourselves down and stand up again that we can overcome that adversity and become stronger because of it not not necessarily a nice thing to say but sometimes when i go into school and i ask so who's the child who doesn't fit in the one that's not following all the trends, who's not a cool kid, who's not in the gang, who maybe has failed an exam, the last one to be picked for the sports team. Well, I always single those kids out and say, you're going to be the future leaders. The rest of you will be employees, and that's great. The world needs employees and team followers. But those of you who are standing out from the ground, who have learned failure early on in life, you'll be the real leaders of the world. 
Great. So it's always confidence, which uh, women hold back, never competence. So great. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, you know, till we, you know, we would request all the participants, if you have any questions, please type it down on the chat box. Um, till then, Nora, another question. Uh, this is around the blue ocean thinking. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you did talk about, uh, you know, saying that we need to be thinking differently and, uh, you know, we are all in a red ocean. And uh, so is there any, any blue ocean thinking that just found the book? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. It is pretty popular, popular here in India as well. So um, right. is there any, I mean, have, uh, were you caught up in a blue ocean sometime and uh, which turned into a red ocean and how did you come out of it? It'd be great to hear your story. So I would say that, um, let me, you know, because I was in Dragon's Den, I have a lot of investments and, and some of them are unique and brilliant and others are obviously, you know, what I learned very, very quickly is it's not the idea, it's the person. So in Dragon's Den, I don't know if you're familiar in India, but people come in and pitch an idea and you have very little time to invest in their businesses. But over time, I realized no matter how brilliant the idea, if the person doesn't have the, the traits of entrepreneurship, by and large, the world thinks there's about seven, but all the ones I've said, you know, resilience, determination, risk-taking, communication, confidence, um, adaptability, all of those, you, you, you generally have those laid down by your, the time you're in your 20s. So the two you learn later in life is adaptability and confidence, which is magical because they're usually the two that you really have to learn later in life. Um, so let me give you an example of a brilliant investment I made, which is still brilliant. Now, somebody is trying to make it a red ocean, but they never will. So um, when the recession hit, there was a brilliant engineer who had worked with a lot of architects to build houses. Think of them as, I don't know, just ordinary semi-detached houses all over the country in Australia, the UK, the US, Canada. And he is laid off at home and he has no work. And he looks at this particular door underneath the stairs. And it's the door where um, usually between, if in these under stairs area, there might be a toilet and then there's a little storage area. So if you open that storage area, for most of us, it's full of dusty old shoes and cobwebs and school bags that we've all forgotten about. And he begins to work on that particular area, that little triangle between the pitch of the stairs and the toilet. And he continues to work on it. And he eventually finds that he can do a pull-out drawer unit and he can develop these units that you can put school bags on and shoes and boots. And then he develops one with a wine rack. So he comes into Dragon's Den and he has, I don't know how you do it in your um, currency, but, but he has about 80,000 euro turnover, which is phenomenal for somebody in the den. And I invested in him. I fought very hard with the other um, dragons, the other investors to get him. And since then, we have gone into all of those countries I mentioned, the UK, Australia, and Canada. Whereas before, um, it was, you had to get a fitter to come and physically put it in. We now have it available in DIY shops, do-it-yourself shops. It comes with a little video. We ship it all over the world. It's perfectly sized to fit 90% of those little triangles under the stairs. We've developed it into bookcases, as I said, wine units, food units. So especially during the downturn, when people wanted to make use of every storage area of their house, it was a very unique idea. Now, we, when we trademarked in um, the UK, for instance, somebody was trying to take that trademark. Uh, it was to do with a different area, so we've rebranded it. It's called Understair Storage, um, and in the UK, we call it Clever Closets. So that was a brilliant idea. What's brilliant about it is that Paul Jacob, who is the CEO of that company, has never veered from that idea. He's doing more every week now than he did in the first two years that I worked with him. Um, but let me tell you, in magazine terms, you know, I, my, my life DNA, I guess, is, as a female founder was in magazines, particularly women's magazines. So I had titles like Tackler. I have a mature women's weekly. They're all here behind me, actually, called Woman's Way. I have a young women's magazine called You. I have a magazine, Food and Wine. I have one for cars, one for your new baby, um, one for cooking as opposed to fine food and wine. And in those kind of areas, they're all pretty much bloodbaths. You know, every time you think you've found a new idea, 
there'll be another 200 magazines in the same space. It's incredibly hard to find something that's very unique um, in that area. And no surprise that we're all now in a digital bloodbath, killing each other, murdering each other online, uh, trying to get advertising revenue, trying to stand out. I mean, if you're in the business of fashion and beauty, um, everybody has the same releases. Our biggest clients are Chanel and Lancome L'Oreal Group. Um, we get the release. We might get a slightly ahead of some of the other titles, but you know, we're roughly all getting the same release of the same products at the same time. We all see Milan Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, New York Fashion Week at the same time. It's celebrity news. Goodness, like when I say I had a weekly, that used to be the pace of celebrity news. Now every minute you can update your feed and find out what everybody's doing. So these sort of areas are, are definitely red oceans. Great. Sadly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, it, it, it was fascinating to hear your story and uh, you know, it just trans, transposed to your world. So tell me from a work uh, perspective, if, uh, you know, as, as individuals where we're working in organizations and we need to be, we are brands in itself and we need to, need to be innovative. What are one or two tips that you could possibly give us? Um, I would say... Um, Firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm never comfortable with the idea that a person's a brand because I have spent quite a lot of my life working with people to encourage them to be their true selves. And even though, you know, it may not fit the profile that we imagine. So for instance, I work a lot with young people on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Typically a job advert will say, good team player, good communicator. It's almost the direct opposite to any young person coming onto the job market who's on the autism spectrum. So now recruitment companies and HR departments are beginning to recognize that actually we don't always all have to be one size. In fact, you know, people on the autism spectrum are probably the best employees you can have. My brother-in-law has got Asperger's, turns up on time, diligently takes his lunch at the same time, focuses on his work, doesn't gossip with colleagues. So, so we need to accept that all of us are different and that even if we are, um, you know, in an organization where culturally there might be a particular personality that we stand out from the crowd by being ourselves. The second thing I would say is that, you know, I talked before about learning from other women. The reason why I obsessively talk to other women is that you always learn something. I was sitting with a woman the other day and she's a very, very senior position with a global company. And I said, what, what was the moment for you? She said, I got into the lift one day and there was my boss and he said, how are you doing? And she started to defend her role. She was saying how great she'd done that year, what her turnover was, um, how she'd managed the team, how they exceeded expectations. And she said for the first two or three floors, there she was defending her role to her boss. And he was just going, mm, mm, mm. Then hopped in a younger guy who was two runs below her. And the boss says to him, so how's life with you? And he said, great. But I'll tell you what, the hedge fund could do with some serious thinking. So he started talking about another job and another position in the bank, which was above where he was already. And he was already impressing the boss with his ideas. So she said, I learned something very important that day. You know, always, always work towards your future position. Never get into the position of defending what you do, but always show somebody above you that you have the ability to leapfrog into another into another role and when they're thinking of who could do that job in the future they'll think of you the second thing is when i learned myself i had i was in london running three companies and my boss was in paris and i worked incredibly hard typically they used to call me a five to niner up at five working till nine and i thought my boss would see that now i was in london and he was in paris i don't know how i thought he was ever going to see me working so incredibly hard but that was just the way i was and then I would go to Paris for meetings and I was always amazed. I was the only female CEO of 46 in this division. There were 152 CEOs worldwide and I was the only female in this 46 group division of special companies. And, and the boss always knew far more about the guys that I worked with than he did about me. And I was talking to a woman who runs a huge newspaper group and she said, I'll tell you what, Nora, you need to learn something. Women will spend 120% on effort and zero on self-promotion. You look at your male colleagues, they're spending 90% on effort and 10% on self-promotion. 
It was the most valuable lesson I ever heard in my life. And every Friday at three o'clock, I wrote an email to my boss and I told him the three or four things that I had done that week. Not always the best. I, you know, I, if there was something bad, I would admit to it. But I started to diligently report to him on things, managing my boss, I guess, on things that were positive about what I did. And do you know something? In the years that followed, I was promoted three times. Wow. Yeah. He let go of me too, which was amazing because this boss had 46 CEOs to manage and he used to start every morning around six o'clock. And I was always the 6 a.m. call. So he would start with the CEO at 6 a.m. every morning and he would finish us all by three in the afternoon. And he stopped calling me after two or three weeks because he felt I was informing him of everything. Wow. That's, that's, that's an amazing tip, um, uh, Nora. And uh, so, I, you know, so I would like to, now we've already uh, be on time. So I would like to close the session by saying that we need to be ourselves and we need to be learning from other women. And we're so glad that we have you to learn from who, you know, sort of took out her valuable and precious time to speak to us. So thank you so much. And thank you. Pleasure speaking with you. So um, let us know what are the, you know, uh, your TED Talks that we could possibly share with the group. And we we'll yeah. That would be great uh, to pass it on. And um, we would love to, you know, sort of be in touch with you. And thank you again. Thank you to all my family of people in India. So very and nice it, to talk to you all today. Thank you <laughs> I'll so be much. back thank soon. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank, much. You. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining in the call. Um, you should hear from us for the next uh, webinar for the next year from Nancy. Thank you so much. Have a great, uh, have a great year end. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.